because they were making submissions. <coughs> uh, well, uh, firstly, a uh, matter that I must deal with internally to us as a committee. You'll recall, colleagues, comrades, we had this meeting set for after the NCOP sitting. And yesterday, uh, the program was changed. And that's beyond our control. We need to alert Bowman's and others who are here from civil society. We apologize, but actually the apologies on behalf of the NCOP powers that be. So uh, between Inkululeko and Mangweni, the secretary and I, we discussed it on uh, a case-by-case basis. As you'll recall, previously we decided to stick to the 430 arrangement because uh, the stakeholder, and there's only one there, uh, we felt shouldn't be asked to change again. So there was a negotiation between Treasury, the stakeholders, and ourselves uh, by the committee. Secretaries agreed we'll start at 10. So I apologize for that. Uh, in Kululeku, have we got any, uh, when I apologize, I do so on behalf of not the committee, but the NCOP powers that be, let me remind you, this is beyond our control. It's regrettable that this happens and at the last minute, uh, the explanations are never convincing in my view. Okay, so shall we hand over then to in Kululeku, any uh, minutes, uh, any apologies? No, apologies, Chapas, and good morning. So everybody's meant to be here who's meant to be here, right? Who should be here who's meant to be here. Okay, then fine. Uh, how many, up till yesterday, we had the one submission. I see this morning uh, you've sent uh, 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 an email again. Uh, now, how many submissions have we got? With the one that I sent you this morning, Chaperson, we have two, but only right. one is going to be presenting. That's right. That only one is coming for... Yeah, just to remind the staff and treasury, you have to respond to both those who are here today for an oral presentation and those who have sent written submissions, right, treasury? And as discussed with you yesterday, by in Kuleleko, instead of losing another three days, uh, we will have the response today, though it may not be a final response and will carry over as the meeting proceeds. Uh, is Frank here? Yes, Chaperson, he is yeah, here. I see he's here. We might seek some legal advice on that. All right, let's hand over then. Look, as there's only one oral submission, uh, you know, we can give them more time. <clears throat> In Kulilekta, did you negotiate 15 minutes with them? I negotiated 10 minutes, Chaperson, with them. I thought I said 15 because, you know, I mean, given that there aren't uh, other submissions, maybe I didn't convey that to you. That's what. Uh, ran through my head, that's what I thought, and perhaps I didn't say it to you, so misunderstanding. You can have 15 minutes, and if you want to, up to 20 minutes, <clears throat> excuse me, because sometimes people come, colleagues from civil society, people come at the last minute and want to make an oral submission. It's not our want to say no. You know, we usually say yes, unless there's some overwhelming reason why we can't accommodate them. So you can have between 15 and 20 minutes. We will then put questions to you, you can reply, and then Treasury can come in and we have a treasury has to say to what you're saying. And of course, there will be a very attentive response from them because they might need to mull over what you've said this morning, apart from your written submission. And if need be, they'll come back to us again to give a further uh, written uh, uh, presentation on their response to what you're saying. And then if you want, you can be there too. But for now, that's the program. And then <clears throat> if there's time and space, uh, we will, within the three hours, not begin to look at the bill more carefully. Over then to our friends from uh, civil society who are here. <clears throat> Chair, good morning, and thank you very much to, uh, to the committee, Honorable Chair, and for members. Um, we are the National Clothing Retail Federation of South Africa. We are um, we, we're with our team of attorneys from Bowman's. Um, we also have um, some industry members here. If I could just for a while outline, indicate that the NCRF membership includes Woolworths, the Fushini Group, uh, Mr. Price Group, Truworths, Pick and Pay Clothing, Cotton on LA Group, Queen's Park, Cape Union Mart. It's, it's a substantial collection of, uh, of, of, of clothing retailers that, that is represented. And for the purpose of, of this presentation, the concerns, of course, play out to the consumers uh, who are serviced by those, by those clothing retailers. Chair, thank you very much for extending the time for us we were going to just ask for um, a little extra time and we do we do appreciate the the opportunity that the committee has given us to 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 just make our submission with with just a little bit more time chair the substance um and and our industry emphasis will come from 
um, the, the specific retail representatives in the room and the legal emphasis will come from our, from the, the, the lawyers and they will they will introduce themselves as they speak. But our, our, our key submission here uh, rotates around the fact that what we have here is a piece of legislation which which we as retailers respond to by saying one size does not in fact fit all. Um, we, we're very concerned about the fact that a number of consumers and potential consumers who are part of the uh, of, of, of the of developing as 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 credit as credit seeking consumers responsibly um, are, are going to be prejudiced, and we will speak to that um, a lot more specifically over time. Um, I'm going to hand over without um, any delay then um, and to the presentation. We do have a we do have a slide presentation. If I could just. Um, we could just share it there. Thank you, Chair. If everyone can see that, if it's not being, if it's not visible, please let us know. Um, but what we what, what we are going to do is just take the committee through through the presentation. We have submitted both the slide deck and we did send in. Uh, and we apologise for the for the late submissions, but we've been working with with very difficult deadlines. Um, and 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 you have you indicated. Yeah, we got it. Fine, we understand. We got it. Good. Um, so, Chair, we, I'm going to hand over then, and I'm going to ask our, um, for legal emphasis to start off. Um, um, Karen will start us off and just introduce herself, and and then we will go straight over to to moving along through through the presentation. We'll take questions afterwards. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. My name is Karen Nathan McCann. I'm an attorney in the banking and financial services regulatory practice at Bowman's. Um, I'll jump straight into the um, presentation. The reason why we're here today is because of the proposed inclusion by way of item 11A um, of including all a person who carries on the business of a credit provider as defined in the National Credit Act as an accountable institution. So that's the basis of um, why we're here and that will our presentations will our submissions are based on that specific inclusion. So just by way of background, um, the NCRF um, has made a submission to the Standing Committee on Finance in the National Assembly regarding this proposed draft change. Um, the current draft amendment, as we are very aware and cognizant, is based on the Financial Action Task Force standard, which requires effectively the act of lending to be included in the scope of a country's measures against money laundering and terrorist financing. Um, we would like to emphasize that the NCRF is very mindful of this and we are cognizant of that, but notwithstanding the, um, uh, the reasoning behind the inclusion, the NCRF formally objects to the blanket inclusion of credit providers as is currently proposed in draft 11A in light of the drastic and materially adverse unintended consequences that such an inclusion will have not only on the NCRF members as credit retailers, but also specifically on retail credit consumers. As a result, um, the NCRF members have proposed an alternative wording because they, as I said, are cognizant of the what is being sought to achieve by this specific inclusion. So I'll just read, um, I'll, I'll take you through it, and I would like to say that the underlined portion is what we are specifically proposing as an alternative. So the first phrase is how it sits at the moment in the draft, a person who carries on the business of a credit provider as defined in the National Credit Act, excluding credit providers offering credit as provided for in section 81A, read with 83, in circumstances where the credit facility in question constitutes a closed loop revolving credit store card where a credit limit is available to the consumer and an installment is payable monthly. I'll just pause there and say specifically what's quite important here is that we're proposing a closed loop environment. So, and we'll maybe speak more on that point later. But I'm cognizant of time, so um, that's the proposal. Can I, no, no, hang on. Excuse me. Uh, we okay. are not technical experts, okay? Okay. We are politicians. We were elected not because of our financial and technical skills. No problem. Um, ideally, we should have people like that in our committee, and our staff assist us in that regard. So can I plead with you 
to use simple language okay. and no explain problem. things to us simply. And okay. also, where you use technical terms, uh, uh, please explain them simply. Thank you. Okay. No problem at all. So what we are proposing um, is we are proposing that we exclude um, registered credit providers who provide credit facilities as defined in the National Credit Act. So that, that part is section 81A read with 83. So those are the providers of credit facilities. However, we are cognizant that if you give a wholesale exclusion to credit facilities generally, that would exclude a large portion of credit providers. So that's why we're proposing the second section after the comma, after 8.3, where we've said specifically, we are trying to exclude what that means in practice is members of the NCRF that effectively have store credit cards where you can only use those cards to buy merchandise in that specific store. That's a closed loop environment. So that's what we're proposing is the NCRF members, their store cards don't let you provide, oh, sorry, make a purchase on credit from a different shop or a different facility. It's within that specific store. So that NCR member, you are limited to making a credit purchase in that store. That's why it's closed loop. And the revolving credit store card is, is just to bring in the legal concept of how, how they effectively provide the credit. And that's to meet with the definitions of the National Credit Act. So I'll just pause there and, and then you can let me know if, if that sufficiently explains the proposed wording or if you have any other questions. Well, we'll let you speak, but colleagues, can I suggest please? Unless somebody has an objection, and please raise it now, let's not force them to squeeze what they're saying into the 15 or 20 minutes. So I, I don't feel we should put you under pressure in a situation where this is quite, com comrades, colleagues, a technically complex bill. So does anybody object for them <clears throat> or to them? Excuse me, I've got this reflux problem. You'll have to excuse me. That's effectively, uh, that's effectively badly this morning. So I apologize for that. Look, very quickly, is there anybody objecting to you know, up to 25 minutes? But remember, you'll be asked several questions. And so by the end of it, you'll have spoken far more than those 25 minutes. Can I see any hands up against 25 minutes? So at least uh, we have a better understanding of the technical concept. It helps us to progress faster on the processing of the bill. Any any hands up? I don't see any hands up. Are there any in Kuleleko? Yes, Dennis. Sir, Mr. Ryder. <laughs> Dennis, as yes. usual, as usual, Chair, you 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 wouldn't expect me not to say something, but no, I, I think yeah. this is a good opportunity for us to learn. So I I would agree with you and say twenty five minutes or as much, really as much as we need, because I think this is a good opportunity to to unpack the contents of this thing and have essentially expert advice given to us for free. So go for it. Thank you. Yeah. No. You know. Okay. So let's settle for up to half an hour if we have to, but don't be laborious. Don't waste our time and your time. You're busy people. <laughs> Uh, 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 <clears throat> but uh, what I'm saying in short is, look, the National Credit Act doesn't fall under us, as you know, it falls under the Department of Trade, Industry and Competition. But those of us who've been around for thousands of years, like myself, have come across it in various forms. We've had joint meetings with that committee, the committee will remember and so on. So let's move on it. You've got up to half an hour. Thank you. But you see your last explanation, although I knew most of it, you sort of affirm for me that are understood, but please remember we have new members here. Well, he came to parliament in 2019. Thank you. But I also don't understand these concepts. It's not about them. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. So um, so that's that's the proposed alternate wording um, for item 11A of Schedule 1 of FICA. Um, I'll leave that there because it doesn't seem that there are any current questions and I'm gonna hand over to Jane Fisher to take you through the next slide. Okay, so we have looked at the practical implications if we were going to implement the draft item as it's currently stipulated. So we have asked for retail store cards to be excluded and to be a carve out in that section. But if there wasn't, what we're saying is by including this in this regulation, you're actually making us subject to the same kind of regulations that a bank would be subject to, which is the know your customer. And that includes the proof of residence. Now, we have looked at the data from the regulator and we said, well, how many customers actually apply for credit at our stores? And it's about 11 million in a year. And we give out about five and a half million credit facilities each year, all with the sole aim of just buying merchandise. That's what it's there for. It's not for anything else. It's purely to buy merchandise at our stores. 
And that limit that we typically give a customer is around about 3,500 or 3,300. So it's small limits that we're giving out to our customers because we're not trying to make money off credit. What we're trying to do here is sell merchandise. And we offer credit to enable the consumers to buy the merchandise. Now, the practical reality is if we had to introduce this regulation, about 30 to 40% of the consumers just wouldn't be able to prove where they live. And we're saying that then means we wouldn't be able to lend to those customers. So now you're going to be excluding around about three and a half to four and a half million customers from actually being able to access that credit and be able to buy that kind of merchandise. And we're saying, you know, that's a barrier, barrier to entry for the credit market. It's at odds with what the NCA is trying to do. And it's also contrary to the, you know, the terms of financial inclusion. Every customer should be able to access credit. So we're saying, you know, we saw this previously with some of the NCA regulations. And when we had to, you know, for the affordability regulations, there was impractical amendments to that. And we saw the impact that that had and that court case that we actually uh, went through with. So we have seen the impact of what regulation can do and whether it works or it doesn't work and does it achieve its stated aim. The next slide actually talks about what... I think that hand's been up the entire time. Um, then we've actually looked at the costs. So what does it actually mean? Because compliance costs money to implement compliance. And you want to implement good compliance. So we have said, you know, if we have a look at this, it would cost us round about 25 to 30 rand per credit application to just be able to do these kind of compliance checks. <laughs> so that would cost round about 235 million to 330 million rand just to implement this kind of compliance. Now, of course, that would be a cost that we would have to bear as a retailer. And, you know, that impacts our profitability and how much, you know, how many jobs we can create, how many stores we can implement and how much employment we can give. And that would just have an undesirable outcome. Nobody wants to have to shut stores, not employ as many people, purely because we've got more costs for compliance that are not adding value. So what we're saying is the cost burden for this is disproportionate to the level of the money laundering financial terrorist risk that actually would happen. People just don't use retail credit to do money laundering or finance terrorist activities. I don't know if there are any questions about the practical considerations that we've highlighted there. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is James McKinnell. I'm a partner uh, at Bowman's and I'll be speaking about a potential const constitutional issue which may arise uh, with, with the promulgation of these regulations in their current form. And if I may just go slightly slowly, I'd like to go back because the previous case which uh, Jane spoke about, which the Federation was compelled to bring successfully to set aside the previous regulation, the so-called affordability assessment regulations, I think it's very important that we focus on that because our advice and senior counsel's advice is that the, this situation is analogous and, may, uh, and, and the same situation may result uh, and we would obviously prefer to avoid that. So what that case dealt with, it also dealt with retail store cards. Uh, the so-called affordability assessment regulations, which were then proposed and which were promulgated and came into effect, what they required is that um, uh, credit providers had to validate gross income of credit seekers, people who were going to be given credit. They had to validate their gross income. And for people who were formally employed, it was not a difficulty because they had pay slips. For people who were in the bank community and who had bank accounts, Similarly, it was not difficult for them because they could produce their bank statements. But what this case centered on is those people and the millions of people who, who were uh, recipients already of credit, but who were not able to produce formal pay slips or bank statements. They were people who were effectively informally employed or self-employed. And what the regulations contemplated is that they, the only way that they could validate their gross income was to provide what were called financial statements. And the case centered on that. And the Federation said that these regulations, and I think it's very important to stress, it was clearly not the intention of the regulations. But you'll all be aware that it's not just intention which, is, which can be struck down. It is the impact of the regulations. And the impact of those regulations was 
that some of the poorest members of society, people who were informally or self-employed, were simply unable to validate their gross income and were therefore effectively excluded. And that's what the, cent the, the case centred on. It was, it was discrimination against that, uh, that sector of, of credit seekers, the informally or self-employed. And that, I think, brings one to what was found in that case um, in, in the Western Cape High Court. And I don't want to just read a long quote to you, but I think it's important uh, j just to stress what the judge found. Um, and Judge Engers found there that, in my view, in discriminating against a section of the population that represents the less privileged and probably also many previously disadvantaged in a manner that is not fair, the regulation for fouls of uh, any quoted sections of PAPUDA, the Promotion of uh, Equality of and Prevention of Unfair Discrimination Act. Uh, he found that it, that it was in, in contravention of that. And then he went a little further. He didn't make a finding, but he said that, that the Federation had also submitted that it contra contravened Section 9.3 of the Constitution because it effectively discriminated on the basis of race. Obviously, that was never the intention of the minister and would never be the intention. But it may well be, he said, an unintended result. If so, he said, it would offend against 9.3, but he made no finding. So he didn't say that it was unconstitutional, but he expressed the view that if it had that impact, then it would be. Now, we think it's analogous because if one thinks about what is being considered here, in that case, uh, credit seekers would have to provide proof of their financial statements because they didn't have pay slips and they didn't have bank statements. Here, they would need to provide proof of residence. And you've heard and you've read the submission that the Federation's members estimate that between 30 and 40 percent of uh, credit, people who already have credit, would simply be unable to comply with this regulation, which is very strict. And they would effectively be excluded. And maybe not immediately, but within a matter of months, they would be swept into the FICA net and they would then be excluded from the credit that they already have, from the responsible, well-regulated credit industry which exists. They would be excluded from that. And so we say that that is analogous and obviously unintended. But if it has that impact, the, 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 the indirect, it's the indirect and obviously unintended impact, but if it has that impact, then it would offend. And we say that for the same reasoning which was held in the previous case, the same uh, judgment uh, with respect would apply and the same consequence would, would potentially pertain and the regulations we say would be subject to being struck down on that basis as well. And it's obviously not something which the Federation wishes to, wishes to do, but it would have no alternative given the very serious impact on a, on a, on a material number of its existing customers. It would have no alternative but to consider doing that. So that is why we, we raise this, just to alert uh, the honourable members and through you, honourable chair, to, to what, is, uh, what happened before and why we say it's analogous and, and what hopefully can be avoided occurring again. Thank you, James. Thank you. <clears throat> so in support of the alternative wording that's been proposed by the NCRF members, um, <clears throat> we'd just like to point out that as far as we can tell, the Financial Intelligence Centre did not conduct a sector study for the inclusion of credit providers as an accountable institution, which, if, if that is the case, in, in our view, is surprising and irrational. Um, it is the NCRF members' view that because of the nature of the business being conducted by the members, as we've said, it's a closed-loop environment in the form of retail store credit, it translates into a very low at the MLTF is money laundering terrorist financing risk. So because of the nature of their business, it is the NCRF's view that that is a very low risk. So objectively, it's a low risk. We'd like to point out that at the moment, if you look at the draft amendments to Schedule 1 of FICA, there's a new inclusion of the high value goods dealers and they become an accountable institution at a transaction value of 100,000 Rand or more. Whereas credit providers and specifically the NCRF members have demonstrated that the credit facility that they provide is an average facility which is around 3,300 Rand. So you've got a very big disproportionate um, that, um, disjunct between who is being caught by these draft amendments. Um, and it, that is our view that the, the, what we are proposing, what the NCRF is proposing as an alternative, is more proportionate to the relative to the mischief that is that is being. Well, that, that the FIC is effectively seeking to prevent. 
We'd also like to um, point out that um, Botswana implemented a knee-jerk response as a result of being FATA waylisted, which had untenable results, and it has since had to be walked back. So we'd also like to you know, put that in, in, before the committee because that's something that we think should be prevented. And then the NCR is really strongly of the view, and we agree, that the committee should insist that the FIC conduct an MLTF risk assessment on the credit provider sector before 11A of Schedule 1 is implemented. We'd also like to point out, and we are aware that the FIC has expressed um, previously that they aren't, they, they aren't supportive of carve-outs to Schedule 1 of FICA. Nonetheless, the fact remains that carve-outs to Schedule 1 of FICA do exist. That's inescapable. Non-life insurers and authorized financial services providers who intermediate non-life insurance are currently excluded from being considered accountable institutions based on the fact that there's a low MLTF risk in those sectors. So um, because it is the NCRF's view that the MLTF risk um, for its members is objectively low, they have a reasonable and legitimate expectation that its industry and its members will be afforded the same consideration and treatment as those already carved out in Schedule 1 of PICA. So in conclusion, um, the practical implications of the implementation of Draft 11A for credit providers, as defined in the NCA, and the retail credit consumers, which we cannot lose sight of, is far-reaching, undesirable, and unnecessary in the NCRF uh, members' view. Um, as a result, the NCRF asks for a carve-out in accordance with the wording as we proposed in the submission and that we've briefly gone through again in the presentation. And as there hasn't been an MLTF risk assessment conducted by the FIC to demonstrate the practical impact to South African consumers, um, as demonstrated in this presentation, the, the current effective um, impact of draft 11A as it stands, it excludes such a large proportion of consumers from accessing credit, which is so important to so many people in South Africa that we think that if there's no other um, recommendation that the committee can come to that such a study is necessary to determine where we are and this carve out is one of the ways to exclude the practical impact for so many people. Thank you. So are, are you actually, who's next? Are you done? We are done, thank you very much. Is that it? That's it, Chair. We're happy to take more time. Okay, all right. Then in that case, well, well, fine. Uh, members, uh, what are your comments, questions, whatever? Whose hand is up? Dennis? Yeah, I see your hand up. Okay, Dennis, go for it. <clears throat> yeah, good morning again to everybody, and thanks for the presentation. Um, so um, I, I note that the presentation is from the retail clothing industry. Um, so yeah, which, which is interest, interesting because there's a number of number of different retail um, uh, kind of uh, I suppose groupings that provide finance, and I think clothing is certainly the one uh that i have the biggest degree of sympathy for and i think that it's often a step up for for people in the bottom end of the market now my first my first job that i got as a young uh first national bank employee way back whenever it was um i couldn't afford to buy a suit um so i got an edgar's account that i opened up in 19 1990. And I mean, that has stood me in good stead over the years, and in fact, has also funded a suit a little while back for my appearance in Parliament. So I, I have a degree of sympathy towards the clothing sector. And I think that the point is well made, that they do often provide that step up and that initial tier of credit where, where credit would be difficult to obtain uh, for people that would not otherwise uh, qualify in, in, in terms of um, uh, normal lending criteria from the banks, etc. I, I do think that there are other 
sectors within the retail market, which which are a little more abusive and perhaps do things a little bit differently. And I mean, also having lived in a mining town, I know exactly uh, what happens on payday when people rush out and buy, you know, higher end goods like like like, like furniture and so on, uh, and then pawn them off uh, towards the end of the month when when the brandy runs out. So so I, I think perhaps a differentiated approach is also important. And I wonder I wonder if a way of achieving that <clears throat> would would be to tie some of the compliance issues around store card limits and also turnover through through the uh, through the through the accounts. And it's just something that struck me now, I think to in in order to differentiate and also to in, in order to to mitigate risk, and I think that 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 um, uh, we, we do need to know as well. The, the FATF, one of the one, one of their primary or or their first, in fact, uh, measurement re relates to assessing risk and applying a risk-based approach. And I think certainly um, this this is relevant here. So applying a risk-based approach, and and certainly I think that that putting some sort of a limit uh, on on the the size of the transactions. And then turnover through the account. You know, if someone is 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 buying stuff, you know, maxing out their account once a month and then settling it the following month, that should raise a red flag and at least cause cause uh, some sort of concern and perhaps uh, a little bit of a, a heightened due diligence process on on that customer. Um, so perhaps we can get comments ar around mitigating the risk through through looking at things like limits and turnover. Um, I've mentioned about excluding marginalized people. That that is quite important. The interesting thing that that was mentioned that hadn't struck me before is the fact that, um, um, of of course, there would be retrospective application, certainly in terms of the know your know your customer issue. And like I say, I opened my Edgar's account uh, chairperson in nineteen. Geez, it's a long time ago. Uh, nineteen ninety 1990 or nineteen ninety one around there. Um, and uh, I don't think Edgar has much of a clue where I am now. They know where to find me, but I don't think they know where I live anymore, and they don't know much else about me. Um, but um, but certainly, I think going back and 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 doing this would be a really costly, tedious, time-consuming, uh, labor-intensive process. Uh, and then we're going to find ourselves following a similar process that Fika's been through. Um, and I certainly don't believe the retail stores have got the um, the structures in place to go and set up uh, an entire FICA compliance type of, of such a, of, of setup like the banks have done. Um, perhaps then a question for Mr. Davidson to answer, uh, if if you can tell me, does this type of financing fall under the DNFBP? So um, uh, let's just get to what that means. It's a designated non-financial business and professions. Um, now, in terms of the FATF, and of course, I mean, we, we, we must always understand these regulations have been put in, proposed in order to mitigate the impact of the, of the FATF grey listing uh, um, uh, situation that we're in. Uh, and there are two specific um, uh, measures in terms of their, uh, their 40 measures that they have. There are two that speak specifically to, to designated non-finance uh, businesses. Um, perhaps if Mr. Davidson can just tell us if, 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 if the retail clothing segment would fall into that, um, it would be interesting. Um, the, yeah, and then of course the risk, the risk to our compliance uh, with the, the FATF requirements. If there is a court challenge uh, on these regulations, perhaps Mr. Davidson again, and I mean this question is again more more towards Mr. Davidson than than towards the presenters. Um, perhaps you could let us know. You know, if if there is a court challenge, if there is a uh, uh, something that 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 gets put out, are we going to find um, that that's going to to affect our ability to comply timelessly with the FATF's um, um, requirements? And then perhaps in closing, Chair, um, perhaps a, a comment that I'd like Bowman's to, to, to comment on. And I think they, they spoke about the fact that there hadn't been a study conducted, that, that these regulations appear to be fairly arbitrary and, and almost a, yeah, I think the word was, or the phrase was used, one size fits all. And, and it's, it's my contention that in trying to comply with the FATF's um, uh, issues, 
that they that they highlighted and the non-compliance that they highlighted. It appears that we've gone with a massive, you know, well, let's just kill kill everything. No, that's perhaps a, an unfair phrase. Let, let, let's just um, uh, put in a, a, a very strong covering everything type of, of, of law um, and try and try and over comply without thinking of the knock on effects uh, in, in that. And I do believe that that in order to achieve compliance, it's going to take the this specific segment of the market uh, several, if not many years uh, to to reach any sort of level of compliance. Um, and if we we are putting regulations out there, um, that are effectively setting us up for failure. I think we stand a risk of uh, of, of being on that grey list for, for for substantially longer time, because you know we're the ones that set the regulations, and if if they're not enforceable, uh, if our own regulations are not enforceable, the FATF I think is going to 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 start questioning us. So I do think that this has been a, a knee jerk reaction, uh, and just a, we'll just put it in. Uh, and then, and I really believe that that, that that this clause or these, yeah. So the the, the proposed wording I think is is reasonable. Um, I'm not sure I would have written it exactly the same, but I do think that 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 in terms of of popping up some sort of a risk flagging mechanism, uh, certainly the, the the size of the of of, of the credit uh, that's been given out and the turnover through the accounts would be the two that I flag. Chair, those are my comments. Thank you very much. Uh, anybody else wants to come in? Do you see anybody in Kulileko? No, Chair, there are no more hands. Okay. Well, firstly, um, <clears throat> I just want to ask uh, your team there from the NCRF, uh, what, what, what did National Treasury say? Uh, obviously, they gazetted the bill with the amendments um well before they brought it to parliament did you make submissions then if so what was their response then tell us a bit more about well tell us a little bit more tell us about what was scoff's response the standing committee and finance um then maybe there's a question treasury can answer if fika is here they can answer does fika always do a sector study um and uh, from what I'm told, we told there are carve outs anyway in terms of what you provide for. <clears throat> Excuse me, then a question really to Treasury. But insofar as the stakeholder here is able to say anything, you may do so too. Um, what is FATA requiring? Uh, are they requiring that people living in informal settlements? are uh, required to provide proof of residence and so on. Although, of course, now that's a requirement to have the vote. So as I understand it, a very large percentage of people, <coughs> excuse me, uh, 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 a very much larger percentage of people now, I don't think it's very much larger. Well, more, more, more people now, percentage wise, of the voting population have uh, proof of residence facilities or can prove their residence because they have to do so now in terms of a constitutional court decision, if I recall correctly, to vote. <clears throat> so it will be easier for them to provide um, a proof of residence. Is that not so? Maybe some of these questions are better answered by Treasury. I hope Vukile, you are listening and others in your team. So <clears throat> is this a requirement by FATF? And if so, I mean, isn't this unfair to developing societies? I mean, a large percentage of our population in, in the South do in fact live in informal settlements. Then um, the experience of Botswana, maybe Treasury should respond to that. Now, <clears throat> on the issue of um, constitutional challenges, uh, I, I see what you presented. It certainly looks credible, Treasury. And I agree with, uh, needless to say, with Dennis on this. By the way, I like that radio, Dennis, in your study or whatever room it is you are speaking from. And I'm pleased to see you've got a South African flag there, rather than a DA one. Uh, but anyway, uh, I like the radio. Now, about uh, the constitutional challenges. Now, uh, you know, Tracy, you should reply, because Dennis is right. It's the same thought that struck me. 
that, you know, do you really want to take a chance if you're not sure about it? And it seems there's some parallel. Maybe there isn't. I'm not a lawyer. But it, on the surface, to me at least, it seems there's some parallel, <clears throat> excuse me again, <clears throat> about <clears throat> parallel between the judgment made earlier and the uh, restriction you have here. Now, it's also true, isn't it, Treasury, that government as a whole, parliament too, has been preoccupied with this, that the businesses provide credit far too freely, and then people find they're worse off in the longer term than they were before they got the credit. Uh, obviously, uh, you know, uh, you, know you, you can ask the more experienced MPs here every now and then. When people don't get their way, I'm not saying this applies here, I'm just alerting you that we are a bit cautious when people say, well, <clears throat> if you go ahead and do this, the skies will fall down, the courts will rule against you, et cetera, right? And most times, not all, most times you find it doesn't happen. People like almost use the constitutionality of a bill or its unconstitutionality as a threat to parliament to proceed on a clause that they can't win through policy means. I'm not saying you're doing it. I'm just saying that we're very cautious when we hear these things. <clears throat> maybe it's a bit unfair, but maybe Advocate Jenkins, you, you might want to say something on that. Maybe it's too soon, but you could come back to us and suggest from parliament side, although you can't tell what a court will ultimately decide, but you can tell us at least from your point of view or the point of the legal services unit, you know, what you think? Is this a substantial challenge uh, that should be taken very seriously, or you can't say, or you don't think it's a serious enough challenge? Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Now, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, yeah, I, I, I've made some other notes here, but I can't understand my shorthand. The two points here. Oh, I, I don't know what I've typed here. It's ridiculous. All right, I'll come back to it. So, so on the one hand, we don't want to be delayed by a treasury by a constitutional decision against us. And on the other hand, when it comes to policy issues, uh, you know, that if you don't give in to what we're saying, we're crushing to court. Now, my view on that is, yeah, you have a right to go to court and let the courts decide we are not lawyers and we seek legal advice from parliament and we ask Treasury for their lawyers to give us their opinions and we can hear your lawyers as we've done this morning. But ultimately it's for the courts to decide, though we want to tread carefully on this particular bill because of its importance. Finally, may I put a question to all the lawyers here? I mean. <clears throat> Would it be, it's a question not just to lawyers, to anybody who can offer insights. Would it cause the world to collapse, our world, South Africa, if the rest of the bill was found to be constitutionally sound, it may not even be challenged, but this part is found to be unconstitutional. Then obviously FATF will say, <clears throat> did we fix that? You've tried, your court has said no. But that's not going to affect our uh, decisions on grey listing or otherwise. So uh, I haven't been very clear in my questions. I agree. It's not my best morning. Uh, but, you know, I, I, I like others in the committee. We need time, actually. Um, we uh, heard from, well, I heard from Nkuleleko that until Friday there was no submission. And secondly, Declare, I see your hands up. I'll come to you in a moment. <clears throat> oh, man, in Jadu, you should share this meeting. I'm not in a good space. Really. <clears throat> I'm really being troubled. I've, I've got a slight flu emerging as well. So, look, uh, what was I saying? I've forgotten now. Um, yeah, so look, basically what I'm saying is... Um, <clears throat> uh, we've got to find the right balances. I, I, personally, National Treasury colleagues from civil society, I am unconvinced really that if this part of all the amendments made were found to be unconstitutional, that it would lead FATF to conclude 
that, you know what, we are not meeting the requirements. Now, I also need to point out <clears throat> that this committee, <clears throat> excuse me, across all parties, excuse me, this committee across all parties, but particularly the ANC, I would like to say, we have consistently held the view that the poor cannot be marginalized and excluded by policy decisions or regulations or legislation we pass in this parliament. We're very clear about that. But we are also clear that the poor and low income earners have also borne the consequences, not just here but globally, of those who seek to secure profits from them. And often we find, when it comes to the private sector, I'm not saying it applies to your colleagues from civil society, but you have to listen to us because these are all the trade-offs and balances we have to think about. You, we know that in search of their own material self-interest, the profit interest, business is always using the poor as an example of who would suffer the most. And it seems to me that <clears throat> given the higher percentage of people who do have a proof of residence, I'm not utterly clear. As it is, it's too early for us to grow any college. Can I just stress? <clears throat> Let's not have knee-jerk reactions. Let's think this thing through. It's more complex than I thought it would be. And we don't want to rush into making decisions. A few days delay in processing this bow is not going to be the end of the world. Uh, Tracy also understood that they'll get this bill through two houses by the end of October. So what I'm saying is, <clears throat> you also have to understand, colleagues uh, from the Federation and your lawyers, that we get this all the time. You know, people, not in your case necessarily, will apply very high charges and so on, or will secure a lot of profits and then present it not as affecting them, but the poor and low income earners of the country. And finally, we need to <clears throat> explain to you, if you don't already know, I'm sure your lawyers do, <clears throat> excuse me, that we have limited uh, legal authority to change this bill. It's not a bill that affects the provinces directly. It's a national bill. And, and, and you know, uh, we have limited space, but as the NCOP, we have a constitutional obligation to act, and if we need people to refer this section back to the <clears throat> um, in, in a committee. Also, we haven't really looked carefully at your submission, we have to admit. Now, I know that we were meant to meet at five o'clock, but that can't be an excuse, strictly speaking, because the deadline was 12 o'clock yesterday. And <clears throat> whether the meeting was at five o'clock, or 4.30 as I understood it to be, or 10 a.m. as it's come to be, the deadline was yesterday. Nevertheless, we won't sort of focus too much, and I've just draw that to your attention. Finally, the submission from Vodacom, I've had a look at it, and it's a very short one, and maybe Treasury, <clears throat> your initial replies to that should be offered too, um, but they have made a short submission which uh, came to us very late, and in Kululeko has sent it out now to the members. So that's a separate issue, but just draw your attention to this, that we're not going to ignore anybody who makes a submission after the deadline, and you're welcome, as, as indeed you are, anybody, uh, to make submissions right to the time we, we vote on a bill. But how much of considered attention we can give it when it comes very late, we, it depends. Uh, we have sometimes been able to do so, and other times, uh, you know, just skim through what people say and, do the best we can. So <clears throat> I see Dikaleri's hand is up, please. <clears throat> Thank you, uh, Chairperson, and good morning to all the participants on the platform and the members. My apologies, Chair. I know protocol doesn't allow that I should speak after you. Um, I just experienced the technical glitches. Yeah, there's there's no such it. protocol, there's no rule. There never has been a rule. I don't know where that comes from, maybe in the ANC, but with due respect, there's no such thing. And it has happened, so please go ahead, yeah. 
Yeah, from what I understand, Chair, I don't speak after you, but uh, thanks for your indulgence for allowing me to speak after you have spoken. Um, I, I I want to to acknowledge and uh, appreciate that you you make you made a disclaimer that we are not a, a financial expert, we are not a technical expert, but also we have the the legal gurus uh, within parliament who might uh, be able or who will be able to assist us in terms of analyzing what is presented here. And uh, you have covered me. I had some of the issues that uh, you and Dennis and the presenters have had because uh, of the technical glitches that I experienced, but I have had some. You know, we, we correctly said, I might uh, raise things that are generic, or things that uh, represent my constituency and including myself in the as a person who comes from the the the, the previously disadvantaged or the disadvantaged uh, or, or, or the rural area. Uh, talking about this issue of FICA, you know, wanting FICA uh, 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 as 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 a requirement. Uh, I mean, implementing FICA as a requirement to have to to require bank statements, uh, pay slip, if not a, a bank statement or a a, 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 a residential uh, proof. I think some of the of the the retail stores they they are abusing this. I don't want to call names. Uh, because you are here representing a group, but there's a popular one that I think it abuses this, but we think I think we need time to understand what these amendments are and what will they how will they impact or benefit the the the, the people like 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 the disadvantage or the people from the 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 the, the poor uh, and rural areas who cannot afford to 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 pay cash um some of the stores they they will need they will tell you about figure and need all three documents residential proof of residence uh, your bank statement your pay slip and over and over again, you will present that when you open an account. But then uh, over, over time, maybe twice or so in a year, they will want that uh, or they'll want you to, 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 to present such documents. And you'll ask yourself, why is, is FICA really a expecting me to always uh, present this to them so i think we need we need to have an understanding of what really are we are we, are we dealing with i know uh, when we were dealing with fika last term uh, in financing and a i was part of that with the honorable chair and uh, there were issues that we were, ra were raised, and they, some of the things we thought they will they will help. But as we go on, and we experience them ourselves, and we hear from our constituencies, it's it's a it's a big problem. And I agree with the chairperson that uh, we don't have to rush. We have to 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 have an understanding, and also maybe let's hear from uh, advocate. What is his take? But uh, I want us to understand exactly what is it uh, 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 that is presented before us, and also uh, getting the views of our our our, our researchers and uh, the content advisors. Thank you, Chair. Uh, well, thank you for that. Uh, anybody else wants to come in? Uh, nobody. All right. Let's start with you, uh, 
the team that's made the submission. Thank you. And then we'll come to Treasury. Um, Chen, did you direct to us? Sorry. Yeah. Uh, questions. You made the submission. So thank you, Chen. Chair, can, we, can I just start out and, and there'll, there'll be some technical matters which will get addressed. Um, we, the, this conversation has been ongoing for uh, quite some time, many years in fact, um, and we have repeatedly indicated to Treasury through various workshops that they've had um, with, at the FIC and at Treasury um, through submissions, um, written written submissions, um, the, the nature of, of, our, of our concern. We understand, we do understand the, the, the limited purview that the NCOP has in this particular matter, um, but we, we, we take the matter sufficiently seriously to have re-emphasized the points that we've made um, at, at every single opportunity um, that, that, that has been given to us. Um, we do not have any record of reply, and I, I apologize if our systems have have failed us in not, um, passing through replies that, that have been received, but we, we, we have made repeated submissions and, and the arguments um, that have been presented this morning um, are entirely consistent with positions that, that we've taken earlier. Um, in respect of the issue of, of the, the other issues around specifics around clothing um, retailers, I think it, it, it's going to be more pertinent if I allow the industry emphasis to come from one of the specific industry members um, in, in the room to address. Jane, if you would speak to those please. Yeah, um, there was comments, I mean, thank you for the time today. There was comments around uh, why is retail credit so important and one of the things that we have done, we did do a study that we presented in Parliament to try and demonstrate how important retail credit was for consumers. And if you look at the journey for a consumer and how eventually everybody wants to have their own house, but most people need to be able to have a credit record to be able to prove that they've got a good credit record to ever get to their house. So we showed in court that we typically are 42% um, of all consumers start with retail credit. Um, we are often the first line of credit. We give out these small limits. We almost do an education part to help customers understand credit, how to use it responsibly. We keep it small. Um, like I said, we don't make a profit off the credit. We make the profit on the merchandise. So the credit's not run for a profit. So for us, if a customer doesn't pay us back, we actually lose twice. We lose once on the credit and we lose again on the merchandise. And that's an important point, which is why I think we've always been listened to when we ask, can we be heard about credit? Because we are different from the banks. And there is nothing wrong with making profit from credit, but that's just not who we are because we're not a bank. So, and we've also shown that if you start with retail credit as opposed to a different form of credit, you're eight times more likely to be able to get to that home loan. So we believe we're a vital part of this whole journey for a consumer and making credit affordable and helping them on that credit journey. And we do think a differentiated approach is required for us, given the nuances of how we run credit. And um, Gary, I don't know if you want to add anything extra to what I've said here. Yeah, I think that just to, to start off, that we 100% support what is trying to be achieved. And the suggestion on tracking specific transactions, we, we do monitor suspicious, suspicious transactions and we're willing to put in any additional traps to catch the handful of transactions which we uh, we currently report, I think that last year we compared, I think it was under 10 transactions that needed to be reported as suspicious, and that could be expanded. And it might be a far more appropriate mechanism to trap suspicious transactions through retailers than the current broad brush approach that's been proposed. So that'll be 10 out of three and a half million. It's uh, out of, it'll be well into the, the 20 million transactions that, that, that we process. Uh, between, between ourselves, we, we, we found 10 that were uh, flagged as suspicious. That could be expanded if there are any additional rules. I think uh, Dennis Ryder suggested. Has been a okay. But of course, there could be many more. Uh, Is it that you would uh, get to 10 or 12 or whatever? Yeah. Okay, but, but it's fine. I, I think uh, that that does convey to us 
uh, what you're trying to say to us. The actual figure doesn't matter that much. Uh, it's just going to be the sense of what the issue might be. All right, please go ahead. Yeah. Chair, if I may, with respect to the impact on the poor, um, I, that, that's the point of the impact assessment. Um, we, we, have, we have indicated um, previously that there is substantive impact and that, that precedent has been quoted, um, but we, we, we actually believe that if, if no one believes us about impact on the poor, we, we don't need you, anyone to take our word for it. There, there is provision in the, in, the, in the process around constructing legislation for impact assessments to be done. And we've, we've indicated a, a specific area of, of concern with what we believe is likely to be a substantive economic impact on, on a very difficult area, or a group of consumers that we should be paying a lot more attention to and being a lot more, um, to use a broad term, caring about. I'm not sure if, we've, if there's anything that we've not specifically covered um, the, 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 there were more comments than questions that, that we managed to identify. Well, some of the questions spilled over into National Treasury. Um, I mean, I, I made about eight points, which were, I thought, mostly in the form of questions. Uh, but I think maybe we'll come back to you. Uh, I see uh, there's a comment from Dennis in the comment uh, chat section. Something to do with, let's see, chat, uh, to do with asking Advocate Jenkins the difference between processing regulations as opposed to a bill from a Section 75, 76 process, okay? Uh, all right, Frank, Dennis, you can come in. Um, I mean, Frank, you can come in. But uh, uh, unless there's a hand coming up now, uh, there's Frank's hand up. Okay, Frank, do you want to go for it before we go back to Treasury? Yeah, thank you, Chairperson. Um, good morning to yourself and honourable members, as well as uh, persons making a submission and staff, my colleagues. Chairperson, um, just to respond to Honourable Ryder's question, these regulations or these um, amendments to the schedules in terms of the Financial Sector Regulation Act cannot be amended by either House of Parliament. Um, it's, a, it's a question of approving it or, or not approving it. It's submitted to Parliament for approval within a certain time and <clears throat> failing that there's a deeming provision, but if I remember correctly, but we can't amend them. We're not, we're not empowered by the act to make amendments. <clears throat> so one will have to refer it back to national treasury to, to take it further, Chair. Chair, just on the issue of constitutionality of these um, regulations, I'm, I'm, I would appreciate the citation of the case that uh, we were referred to. But just in general, Chair, that the limitation on those rights, whether it's a, a Section 9 right, which is the Equality Clause, or Section 10, which is human dignity, which the Constitutional Court has said finds expression in all your protected rights in the Bill of Rights. So those rights um, can be limited, of course, but only in terms of Section 36. And Section 36 of the Constitution envisages a, a balancing exercise. That's why it would be useful to get the citation of the other case. One can then look at it because the question is, is the balancing exercise similar or the same? Um, this, this being, uh, I'm, I'm talking about the amendments to the schedule, being a fat up issue and compliance on those international levels and the implications of not complying will have a different effect. Uh, on, 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 for whatever other reason, there were a request in terms of the FIC to present um, certain documents to make sure someone earns enough to, to, to get credit from a retailer. So, Chair, the, those are the things that one will have to look at. But I can say, um, I don't know if Treasury will come in, and I'm not trying to pass the buck, but if, as indicated to the committee, that there has been continuous engagement on the same issues that's been raised here in this committee, which would include this court case, as well as the question of constitutionality. I'm sure National Treasury has already formed a view on that. And um, uh, it's an assumption that I have. So, so we want, might get some advice there, Chair. That's all from me for now. Thank you very much. Uh, okay, thanks, Frank. I think we're gonna come back to you, right? Because we can hear Treasury and we can hear their lawyers, but ultimately we go by what the legal services unit, well, we take everything into account, but we have to have the legal services unit on behalf of parliament, as we have to have our staff. So can I alert the team that we really need a lot of work done on this, 
independent of what Treasury says. My own view, we are having a meeting of the staff later this week to discuss this. Um, uh, our reports have to exercise more effective oversight, you know. Uh, I know it's difficult on the NCOP side, uh, except on 76 polls and all that. I hear what you're saying, Frank. But can we plead now, Frank, with you and with the staff coordinated by Esther, Poppy, and in Kuleko, can you please uh, uh, help the committee uh, to understand these issues and come to an independent view from the executive, obviously. Uh, now, can we go to uh, Treasury, please? I see Bukile is here. I don't know who else is here from National Treasury, but Bukila, you are probably coordinating the team from Treasury. Uh, I, I, yeah, thank you so much for the opportunity to um, talk a response given, um, given the timing of when we received the comments. Chair, if, if you Bukile, may, I'll just, we would like to- not, yes. You're not very clear, but I hope if need be, I'm not a tech expert or anything, but often they say switch off your, your, your screen. That helps, right? But let's see. You're getting a bit clearer to all right, fine. Secondly, look, I think it's a bit unfair. You got the submissions uh, uh, late, and I'm not expecting that you're going to reply, to uh, give you a full reply now. So at the end of this meeting, we'll decide whether we meet on Friday or Thursday or whatever, or Friday morning. We'll decide that quickly before we part this, uh, before we leave this meeting. But in the meanwhile, we do need your tentative response. We can't waste any time. We can't lose this time. So, and they hear, and they can respond to you as well. So can you respond to questions without understanding colleagues and the civil society stakeholders here that this tentative response will come with a fuller response uh, at our next meeting, which will be later this week. Right, go for it, please. Uh, th thank you, Chair. Um, and, and as you noted, what, what, what we're going to be presenting is this very initial um, responses, um, and, and, and we'll of course follow the process as, as, the, as you've outlined, Chair. Um, if if Janine could help me project this slide, I, I usually have problems simultaneously projecting and and have acting having access to my microphone. That that would be useful, Chair. What, what we'll do is take you through some. So some of the, the the big highlight the big principles that have been um, that have been identified by the presenters. Those really relate to to three uh, big areas. The, the first is this this question, chair, of of financial inclusion and and, and trade offs. And and chair, you you and honourable rider um, identified some really important um, issues um, in in relation to this. Um, of course, chair, we would all be aware of the. Of, of the real um, deleterious effect that uh, unsecured debt has had on on the lowest um, uh, on, on the lowest earning parts of of of, um, of our society, um, and and really, chair, this is something that we've been we've been grappling with and working very hard to address, and and the impacts are are severe on families, uh, and and very often can be intergenerational. So I I, I would really uh, just maybe highlight um, that, that this broad aspect of, of, of the complexity of, of financial inclusion. I thought I'd just mention that at the top chair, just um, just as a as a, a, a as, as a broad statement. Yeah, yeah. In, that's addition, in addition to the, uh, to that chair, um, we do of course still recognise that. Um, whenever we have to subscribe to international standards, there can be a, a, a tension between uh, domestic implementation and the way that those were crafted. Uh, and in fact, when it comes to financial inclusion and the good aspects of financial inclusion, Chair, uh, we've really taken a, a leading role at FATF uh, trying to ensure that whatever comes out of, of FATF sufficiently takes into account the impact on on, uh, on on poorer economies and individuals, uh, including work that we've done in making sure that jurisdictions are not wholesale de-risked, which means just um, cutting off entire populations uh, from access from access to to, to financial um, to financial services. So that's on financial inclusion. Um, che, we'll also take you through um, what what we think. Um, addresses a lot of the concerns raised, which is this question of proportionality. Um, Chair, exclusion does not equal proportionality, but rather a risk-based approach that we'll outline. Um, that takes into account um, 
the the risk the inherent risk of 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 the activities um, being undertaken in in, in a particular uh, subset uh, subset subsector, um, and having and having us have the applying a proportionate um, regulatory approach on those sectors. Um, Jay, it's important to know that risk can evolve over time. If we think about maybe 20 years ago or 30 years ago, perhaps. Um, dealing in, in scrap steel would not would not have been a, a higher risk entity. But fast forward to where we are today, uh, I think we can all be acutely. I think we all acknowledge that the risk can involve and and wholesale exclusions of sectors can complicate understanding evolving risk. Uh, but our colleagues from the FIC will will go through that uh, in, in later detail. Lastly, chair, at the top of the presentation, we're gonna we're gonna take you through. Uh, what we believe will demonstrate that that the through the the engagement over multiple years that this does not represent uh, what, what has been termed uh, a knee jerk, um, but but rather a, a, some careful consideration. So if we can go on, uh, Janine, to slide to the next slide, please. <laughs> Chair, on the consultation process followed, uh, uh, I'd just like to highlight that the consultation commenced in, in March of 2017 uh, with the consultations of regular, with relevant sectors and supervisory bodies continuing for the next two years to 2019. National Treasury published and uh, proposed amendments to the schedules uh, on, the, on the 19th of June 2020 with the closing date of, of, of uh, a month later, um, or two months later rather, in, in, in August. Uh, the comments were received and, and incorporated where relevant. Chair, the minister then approved the amendments, uh, which we tabled uh, at the end uh, uh, of um, March in 2022, um, and the amendments were, were then tabled on, on the 17th of, of May 2022. The standing committee, Chair, held public uh, comments uh, and, uh, and, and we engaged with commentators um, at, at that level as well. Next slide, please, Janine. So the comments received on, on the schedules of the FIC during the consultation period, um, Chair, um, really um, re related to, uh, to, to, to a, a few key areas. Uh, sorry, Janine, I think we may have skipped two slides. Can we go back one? I seem to have a slide missing. Okay, so maybe sorry. Go ahead. Um, so, chair, the, um, the 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 broad uh, comments that that we received um, really um, related to a couple of areas. The first was um, the exclusion of certain business sectors, uh, which is, I guess, in, in line of, of the comments that we've we've heard today. Uh, we've also received a request for clarity on certain aspects of drafting, uh, which which we've accommodated where where appropriate. Um, there were 11 entities overall that commented. Uh, Chair, one, one requested gu uh, guidance on certain uh, aspects of the FIC in relation to crypto asset service providers. Another um, uh, recommended that draft amendments uh, be implemented before October 2022, taking into consideration submissions from relevant role players. Uh, another chair uh, commented on item one of schedule two, that the JAC should be the supervisory body of authori authorized users of an exchange. Next, next slide, please. The rest of the eight uh, comments um, uh, from, from entities raised issues in the following areas with, with respect to, to schedule one, uh, which is accountable institutions. The first is on item two, trust and company service providers. The next was on item eight, life insurers. Uh, then we had comments relating to item 11, credit providers, uh, and, and item 20, high value goods dealers. Chair, it would be important to note uh, that one of the concerns expressed um, and, and raised during, during the minister's consultation period uh, and, and covered in the table of comments or in the extensive uh, comments matrix that, that, that we produced uh, was regarding uh, the 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 process uh, that that was submitted to to the committee secretary, uh, chair. The national, the national treasury and FIC uh, made a presentation to the standing committee in relation to the comments received uh, on 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 the twenty fourth of August, uh, of of which I, I I believe that today's commentators were may have been a part. But I stand under correction. Chair, will then go next slide, please, Janine. 
Joe, we'll, we'll, we'll then deal in, in the, with, with, with some of the substantive issues that were raised by today's commentators um, as, as an initial response. But as you, as you outlined, Chair, um, the, these do represent an initial responses and, and we can provide uh, detailed, more written responses um, as, as you would prefer. Um, may, may I ask uh, Peter Smith from the FIC to take us through these, these substantive comments, please, Chair? Um, thank you very much, Vukile, and with your permission, Mr. Chair. Um, so, as, as Vukile had said, and I think the, the uh, commentators from the NCRF has also indicated, that there, there has been a lot of discussion on this particular issue on the exclusion uh, of certain types of, of uh, credit uh, uh, facilities, credit transactions, etc. And um, some of the wording that has been proposed has also been considered in the past. In fact, when the minister first consulted on this issue, uh, we made an attempt to, to create such a category um, uh, that, that could be excluded, but that, was, that proved to be unworkable. Um, and that was also pointed to us in some of the comments that we've received from commentators, commentators in that process of the minister's uh, consultation uh, process. Um, uh, Janine, if you can move to the next slide. Um, so I think it's important to understand, uh, firstly, a few things. Um, the, the FATF, and this has also come up in some of the questions, uh, the FATF standards requires that um, lending business be included in the scope of a country's measures against, financial, uh, against money laundering and terrorist financing. And the FATF categorizes lending business as uh, a type of financial institution. So this is uh, to Mr. Ryder's uh, question earlier. Um, the FATF doesn't consider lending as part of the designated businesses and non-professionals. They consider this to be part of the, the financial institutions that have to be covered. Um, in the FATF standards, specifically where they talk about lending, they provide a footnote to clarify that lending specifically includes consumer credit. Um, and financing of commercial transactions. Um, so we have to take that into account in the structure, how we then um, translate that uh, standard of the FATF into the legislative framework that we have. And the, the reference point for us to do that is the National Credit Act um, that uh, defines the scope of what lending business is, how that translates into consumer credit, et cetera, in our know, um, uh, domestic legislation. Um, the uh, uh, difficulty that we have is that in the NCA and the categorization of, of uh, credit business, um, the NCA defines a very wide uh, category of credit facilities, and that covers a, a large range of uh, disparate types of institutions, uh, including the, the types of institutions that the NCRF uh, uh, represents. Um, and this is why, when I said earlier, um, has been a challenge and why it's, been, uh, why it's proven unworkable to find a way of excluding certain types of transactions. Um, <coughs> this was exactly what we experienced during the minister's consultation process, um, where it was pointed out to us by a number of commentators uh, from the private sector um, that these types of exclusions that we were attempting to make um, uh, in each case catches a type of credit facility that actually should be included in the scope of our um, money laundering and uh, anti-money laundering and, and, and terror financing legislation. Um, because of the, the wide definition uh, or the wide category of institutions that are included in uh, the, the NCA. We can move to the next slide. Um, some of the examples uh, that were uh, identified, for instance, uh, uh, store, uh, included the types of store cards that were mentioned again today, but those also then uh, by definition covers uh, credit cards because those store cards in fact operate as credit cards, uh, overdraft facilities, revolving credit facilities, et cetera. Um, and in the NCA, uh, the National Credit Act, uh, it doesn't define these by reference to um, the, the values or the volumes of transactions or the, the nature of the type of uh, credit provider. Um, in other words, the business sector in which the credit provider operates. Um, after the, the, the um, sorry, Janine, just before we move on. 
Um, after the um, representations that were made again in, in the uh, Standing Committee of Finance, uh, we went back to the National Credit Regulator to confirm this uh, and, and obtain a, a, the confirmation from the National Credit Regulator again um, uh, of, of the scope of, of the section uh, in the National Credit Act. Um, unfortunately, Mr. Chair, as, as you, we are also not the, the experts on, on credit law, but we, we did uh, make contact with the National Credit Regulator to uh, obtain their advice on this. And we can move to the next slide. Um, I think it's important also to touch on the, the point about the risk assessment. Um, the the um, South African authorities, the executive conducts uh, an ongoing regular risk assessment uh, of our, um, uh, not just the regulatory framework, but also the uh, practical implementation of our anti-money laundering and anti financing financing um, uh, environment in order to identify where emerging risks may be coming from and what new aspects we need to be aware of um, so that we, are, we can react quickly um, and implement the correct uh, measures, either through legislation or through policy changes, et cetera. But one example, I think, is, for instance, uh, the inclusion of um, a crypto asset service providers, which has been identified as an emerging risk. Um, the inclusion that, that's uh, also part of these amendments before you uh, to include high value goods. And those are the sort of things that have been based on risk assessment as well. What is important here is in the context of uh, the insurance business, the risk assessment that was done there in respect of non-life um, uh, providers of uh, uh, insurance products, in other words, short-term insurance, um, and their intermediaries was done in order to determine whether that sector should be included in the FIC Act scope or not. There is no international standard, and there's nothing that requires any country to, in the world to, um, to include short-term insurance in, in the anti-money laundering framework. Um, but in our experience, uh, we have uh, come across a, a number of uh, instances where um, the engagement between the authorities and the short-term insurance provider uh, to obtain information that the short-term insurance provider might hold of their customer would have been very useful to, uh, to follow a, a trail of um, uh, spending by a, a person of who's, who's, been, uh, who's under investigation. And for that reason, we conducted the risk assessment to determine whether that ju would justify the inclusion of the sector in the, um, in the scope of the FIC Act. Um, the result of that was that the, uh, the inclusion of the, um, the sector in the scope of the FIC Act um, would, it would not be necessary, um, but that there would be certain uh, arrangements uh, for the sharing of information, the access of, to customer information uh, from, between authorities and, and the, um, the providers of, of short-term insurance uh, and the intermediaries. Um, so this, the context of this, I think, is very important to understand. That this, there was no international requirement that uh, has kind of required this of us, uh, which is different in the case for, for credit providers, um, as I've explained just now. Um, the uh, uh, provisions in the FIC Act that are, um, relating to insurance um, cover what we are required to cover in terms of the international standards. In other words, long-term insurance and their intermediaries. And there, there's no carve out as far as that is concerned in comparison with what we are required to, to cover in terms of the, uh, the international standard. Uh, we can move to the next uh, slide. Um, so yeah, I think it's important just to emphasize here yeah, that the current scope, for instance, on, on insurance intermediaries um, is aligned with what is provided for. And again, this is where we translated the, the international standard into our domestic legislation using the Financial uh, Advisory and Intermediary Services Act, the FICE Act, as, as the reference point. Um, and so the intermediaries that are uh, required to be covered and the insurance providers that are required to be covered uh, who are regulated under the FICE Act and under the uh, supervision of the FECA are also covered under the FIC Act. We can move to the next. Then I think it's important uh, just to point out a few things um, that also were mentioned in, in the submission today. And I think um, 
we, we've dealt with the, the time period for the comments, um, and, and I think that that's not an issue for, for us really to, to consider, just to make the point that, that uh, has been made before, that uh, the conversation around this issue has been carrying on for, for some time, and um, we, we, we very clearly understand the, the point that is made uh, by the, the commentators. Um, we have uh, done our utmost to give due consideration to that um, in, in the, uh, over the course of the process. Um, the next slide, please. I think this is the important, uh, maybe the most important aspect of the, um, uh, the discussion today. Um, the concern is that the FIC Act requires a one-size-fits-all uh, approach to compliance with the FIC Act. In other words, the comparison was made between a retail <coughs> credit provider and a bank. Um, and I think that is... It, 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 precisely what the FIC Act does not require. Um, the FIC Act, uh, if you can move to the next slide. Um, the FIC Act requires that institutions should apply a proportionate uh, approach to their compliance with the FIC Act. Proportionate here is proportionate to their own understanding of how they are exposed to the risk of money laundering happening through their business or data financing happening through their business. Um, I want to make it very, very clear. Um, there is no requirement in the FIC Act whatsoever for an institution to, to obtain a proof of residence as part of compliance with the FIC Act. Um, that was a requirement under the regulations with the F under the FIC Act up until 2017. Those regulations were repealed and there's no such requirement. In fact, the FIC Act does not prescribe any measure that specific means that an institution should use in order to comply with its uh, obligations uh, to know um, who they are doing business with and to have sufficient information about the customer to uh, um, uh, mitigate the possibility that the institution might be uh, exploited for la the laundering of proceeds of crime or, or financing of terrorism. Um, and I'll come back to this point just now in, in response to some of the, the specific comments, for instance, also around the constitutional uh, court matter uh, that, that was raised. Um, the, I think the, the, the bottom line or the, the crux of the issue for us here is that uh, the assumption is that a credit provider has to have some information about their customer, even at the lowest end of credit provision, in order to ensure that they um, can recover the funds from their customer or that the customer can engage with them, they can engage with the customer um, in, in the servicing of the credit facility. And I think uh, just to explain, and I uh, hope our understanding of a credit facility is, is uh, similar to, to those of, of the commentators, a credit facility is an ongoing relationship with a, a, a customer uh, where that enables the customer to draw down on that credit facility, make use of the credit up to a certain limit, um, uh, repay the, the credit um, and as they repay the credit they can make use of the credit again and so that cycle continues and that, that becomes a, an ongoing relationship with the customer. Um, in that sort of environment um, the, uh, the institution is, has the flexibility under the FIC Act to determine which information they require about the, what, what they want to know about their customer in order to uh, have uh, identity information of their customer on their record and what to what lengths they want to go to verify that information uh, that they've obtained. Um, so in, uh, in the context of the FIC Act, um, uh, if, a, if a credit provider today can access credit and can satisfy these requirements in the lowest bracket, if, if I can call it that, of, of credit provision, the, the sort of market that have been mentioned in, in the presentations today, and the credit provider is, is satisfied that they can safely provide that credit, that they are um, comfortable, that they can manage their risk of default, for instance, on that loan. That information, in our view, should be equally sufficient to satisfy the pick act requirements. Um, it's, it is when the risk increases, the credit provision, the amounts, the volumes, et cetera, increases that more information would be proportionately required and, and more verification would proportionally to be required. And again, that would be in the discretion of the, the credit provider to determine what that would be. Um, so I think the comparison, for instance, to say that credit providers would be treated as banks is, is entirely incorrect. Um, and, and there's this, in the scheme of the FIC Act currently, 
uh, a very large range of institutions that are covered as accountable institutions, some very small uh, institutions and some very large complex institutions. And each one uh, is, um, uh, has to structure their compliance with the, uh, with the FICF according to the nature of their own business. Uh, we can move to the next slide. I think the cost of compliance has been mentioned. And uh, in, in this case, again, um, the, the point around cost of compliance was tied to the requirement to prove residence. Um, and as I've said, that, that is not a requirement under the FIC Act. Um, the, the cost of compliance uh, is equally not uh, linked to the specific transaction um, uh, requirements. In other words, once uh, an institution has uh, um, uh, brought a customer into their business in this uh, arrangement of, of a, a, a client relationship, um, an ongoing relationship with their customer. They would incur the cost of uh, identifying their customer, obtaining the information of their customer and the verification thereof at the outset when that relationship starts. There, there's no repeat of that at every transaction that the customer uh, conducts subsequently. Um, there would be a, a, a requirement for the institution from time to time to make sure that the information with the customer is still up to date, um, that the customer circumstances is st are still the same as they, when they were brought into the business. And again, this would be very similar to the type of uh, information that a credit provider would uh, obtain of, of their customer over the course of servicing a, a, an ongoing credit facility. Um, because uh, the customer's changing circumstances with that in, in and of themselves have an impact on that uh, credit facility. Uh, we can move to the next slide. Okay, we will come to these. Uh, I'll, I'll quickly run through these and then I'll come to the, uh, the some of the more specific points that were also raised. Um, uh, Mr. Chair, you mentioned that Vodacom also made a, a, rep a representation. We had a very uh, a quick look uh, at uh, the Vodacom presentation. Um, their presentation was uh, on the uh, item dealing with uh, money remitter business. That is item 19 in the in the schedule uh, schedule one to the FIC Act. Um, and the questions that uh, Vodacom asked is what would be the impact uh, of the uh, this item on a business that provides money remittance business in addition to a different type of business that fall completely outside of the scope of the FIC Act. Um, now, I think firstly, to, it's important to understand that the, the, the amendment that is provided here is to provide, uh, allow, bring um, so-called informal or alternative uh, remittance providers also into the scope of the FIC Act. Uh, a remittance business is a very strictly regulated business under the exchange control regulations, and it is supervised by um, the Financial Surveillance Department of the South, South African Reserve Bank. And any institution that is currently already uh, authorized under those regulations to remit funds would be uh, an accountable institution under this item 19. Um, theoretically, that uh, category of business also would include uh, the businesses that provide the same service, but who are not uh, formally registered uh, or authorized by the Financial Surveillance Department of the Reserve Bank. Um, the confirmation that um, this amendment provides is more for legal certainties to ensure that it's clear that those um, uh, informal remittance providers would be considered to be a money remitter and would fall under the scope. Um, albeit that they would not be oper operating with the authorization of the uh, Reserve Bank. So to Vodacom's question, um, an institution that provides this business and is a registered uh, money remitter in terms of the exchange control regulations would have to comply with the FIC Act for that portion of its business for which it is registered. If it also does uh, a different line of business, in this case it would be a tel uh, telecommunications uh, business, um, that falls outside the scope of the FIC Act and the FIC Act would not apply to the business uh, in, in that context. Um, it would be up to the business to, to decide whether it's, it's simply easier for them to apply the same uh, onboarding processes, et cetera, across their business or whether they want to ring fence that for their remittance business uh, and not apply to the rest of their business. But there would be no FIC Act implication there. Um, so I think that deals with all the comments that we've received. Okay, yeah, I think this just confirms the, the point I was making that uh, the, the 
Um, the scope of the item 19 ex extension is not to aff affect uh, businesses that are not currently uh, already providing this, but uh, to bring in the informal uh, side of the business as well. Uh, can I then see if there's another slide? I think just a round up, and this is also important for the, um, the discussion today, um, to understand what the implications are for the in future for new sectors that are coming in, including the, the, the credit provider sector, but also um, the others that are um, brought, that will be uh, come accountable institutions, um, for instance, the high value goods dealers and, and, and the likes, uh, who, uh, where those categories of business are not accountable institutions at the moment. Um, the, the first requirement for them will be to register with the FIC Act. Um, and it's this, uh, I, I want to uh, emphasize, there's no cost, there's no formality, there's no requirement uh, of uh, um, uh, authorization um, required for registration. It's simply an act of um, uh, making use of the registration portal that the FIC provides online. Um, providing the information about the entity that is registering, um, who its points of contact, et cetera, will be for the uh, duration of its um, business as an accountable institution. There, there are no fees requirement and uh, registration is not a, a barrier to doing business. Then um, there will be guidance, uh, formal guidance products provided, guidance uh, documents on um, uh, the application of the FIC Act, what the FIC Act requires of institutions, especially a play, a, explaining the risk-based approach, the proportionate um, compliance requirements. Um, a lot of this guidance is already um, uh, was already developed and provided before, and the, that will be brought to the attention of the new categories of institutions. Uh, some of the new categories uh, require sector-specific guidance, and uh, the FIC is already uh, in the business or in the process of developing the first drafts of the, uh, those. Um, in the context of guidance, any new guidance that the FIC will issue must first be um, uh, put through a process of consultation with the affected sectors um, so that they can contribute to the formulation of the guidance. Um, and that is something that is hard coded in the FIC Act. Uh, no guidance can be issued without a consultation process. So that will be part and parcel of the process of, of new guidance that, that will be developed. Uh, for the, the specific sectors that where, where that may be required. Um, on the, in, 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 uh, the, the inspection and enforcement uh, side, the FIC understands, uh, and not just the FIC, the other se uh, uh, sector supervisors understand that a new category of uh, institutions cannot be expected to comply with the FIC Act on the day that the FIC Act becomes applicable to them. Um, that has never been the case in, in the past when new categories of institutions were, um, were uh, brought into the, the scope of the FIC Act or when the provisions of the FIC Act were amended over, over the years. Um, so with that understanding, uh, the, the sector uh, supervisors and the FIC follow an approach where um, we engage with the sectors and monitor their uh, ability to bed down their compliance programs, their uh, internal uh, structures uh, for compliance with the FIC Act um, and, and allow a, a, pro a period for that uh, to take uh, effect and mature. Um, and in our past experience, that has been roughly 12 to 18 months, depending on the sophistication of, of, of uh, level of sophistication in a, in a particular sector. Um, it is only once uh, uh, the sector-specific uh, supervisors or the FIC um, are satisfied that institutions um, uh, are able and um, have had the, the, the made use of the time to adapt uh, to comply with the FIC Act that uh, a supervisor would start considering any enforcement action uh, against a, uh, an accountable institution for non-compliance with the FIC Act. Um, I think just to pick up on the point of um, the constitutional court judgment, um, now obviously I've, I've not had, uh, the team here have not had uh, the opportunity to study the judgment, but just uh, at, a, at face value, um, we believe there is a, a significant point of distinction, um, and that lies in the point that, uh, that I made earlier, that the FRC Act does not require specific 
uh, documentation from for, for or does not prescribe specific documentation um, that an accountable institution should obtain from its customer. Um, so uh, the um, the institution that does business with its customers must determine what information it requires or, uh, from its customer and um, how it will uh, verify that information that it requires from its customer and whether it needs any documentation at all. Um, in many cases, the, the verification is not done with the prov prov providing any documentation, um, depending on the nature of the business. Um, so proof of residence is certainly something that is not required, um, and there's no prescription around that. And I think that would be an important point of distinction uh, in, in this instance. Um, the, the question of whether this uh, requirement for credit providers to identify their customers, um, conduct due diligence on, on their customers, the level of due diligence required, et cetera, whether that will be exclusionary or not, I think very much depends on how in, uh, the, uh, the credit providers themselves implement this legislation. Um, and I think some of the comments that are, for instance, from Honorable Mashlangu, if a credit provider today asks a customer for FICA documentation, they are grossly misrepresenting uh, the, uh, the current requirements to that customer because there is no such requirement on a, on a credit provider to, to ask for FICA documentation. Um, so I think that is the sort of thing that, that we want to address through guidance and through engagement with the sector um, and to understand very clearly um, that the, what the expectations are uh, that institutions with uh, the providers themselves, accountable institutions would have of their customers um, and to what extent that is aligned with their, their obligations to comply with the FIC Act. Um, the FIC Act uh, wording in uh, the due diligence requirements is that the institution itself must be satisfied that it knows who its customer is. Um, and we believe credit providers are in a position to do that uh, as, a, as a natural uh, um, aspect of the, the type of business that they are in. It would have been very different, for instance, if we were dealing with, uh, with a, a different type of retail sector that deals with customers on a, a once-off basis and uh, uh, would not have any interest in having a, a, a long-term ongoing engagement with a customer. I've dealt with the exclusion uh, point, uh, and uh, um, I think, it, again, it is important for us to, to reiterate that, um, especially where in interna the international standard requires of us to uh, cover a particular category, that um, we, we do not uh, advise any uh, exclusion or carve out for that category that is required to be covered. Um, by the international standard. Um, in our case, or in our view, um, the argument for such a carve out can only be made if, if we are convinced that there is no risk of money laundering or terror financing in that, um, that sector. If there is risk, even if it's low risk, uh, that risk needs to be managed through the, uh, the provisions that the, the FIC Act and other legislation provide for. Um, the um, the question of whether an, uh, an industry should be included in the FIC Act that is not covered by the, the, uh, um, the international standard, obviously that is something that is in our own uh, interest and in our own discretion, um, and where that is clearly motivated by risk, that makes the case for us to include such a category uh, in the scope of the FIC Act. Um, there was a question or a point, I think, from uh, Honorable Ryder on retrospective application. Um, I think just you know, to emphasize that these amendments do not have a retrospective uh, application. Um, uh, retrospective implementation of legislation can only be done if legislation specifically uh, and expressly provide for retrospective application. Um, and that is not the case in, in, in this instance. Um, so this does not mean that um, uh, uh, credit providers or any other uh, category of accountable institution has to go back in history um, and obtain information. What they would have to do, though, I think in, it's, it's uh, important to, to understand also is in um, the context of updating information at regular points in future, um, that, that is something that is in the hands of, of the accountable institution themselves. It, to determine how often and when they want to update information, what information they need to update, and uh, with the regular, regularity with which they, they need to do that. 
that is part and parcel of the, the, uh, the proportion of or the risk based uh, process for institutions to comply with uh, the due diligence um, obligations of the FICA. So it may mean, for instance, um, in, in a, 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 the ordinary run of the mill, uh, low risk retail sector that a, a customer would be, um, require to update information once a year, once even two or three years, depending on the need of the institution itself. Um, it might be that the institution needs that updating more regularly than that, not for FIC Act compliance, but for its own business purposes. Um, and that would then be aligned with the way that the institution chooses to, to, to do the business. Um, I think just on, on the point of alternative wording and, and the, also the proposal that was made by the NCRF, um, as I've said in the beginning, it, it's um, difficult for us to provide um, uh, alternative wording which does not have a precise legal certainty when we describe uh, a category of accountable institution. Actually, it's not difficult. It's something that should be avoided at all costs. Um, because if, if the, the, it, it's not precisely um, clear uh, in the description of a category of accountable institution, um, and there's no legal certainty around that, um, not, neither the FIC nor the supervisors nor the industry themselves would understand when does an institution fall within this category, when does the act apply to them and when does it not. So the lines need to be drawn very clearly in, in black and white to, to deter, describe what is an accountable institution and what isn't. Uh, terms that do not have legal definition, um, therefore provide, we bring in vagueness in, in the descriptions, which is a, in and of itself a, a ground to strike down a, 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 an amendment such as this. Um, and uh, th I think that that has been our challenge, um, in, in especially in this area of, of credit providers and in the context of the, the National Credit Act, which is our legal point of reference that we have to make use of uh, for, for the purpose of legal certainty. Um, just uh, lastly, uh, some of the questions that the chair had raised. Um, the, the FATF requirements um, and how that applies to uh, specific requirements that the FIC or the, the South African authorities implement in, in, in South Africa. Um, the FATF standard is not prescriptive on the types of documents that means the measures that institutions should be required to use when they conduct due diligence. The, FIC, the FATF standard is actually very clear, express on this, that um, uh, institutions uh, should be required to make use of the information that is available in a particular country system to comply with the requirements um, to, to, to meet the, the expectations of the standards that for institutions to do due diligence and to know their customers to be able to identify when suspicious transactions should be reported, et cetera. Um, and the FATF has been very um, uh, uh, focused on this issue because of the issue of financial exclusion. And I've been at pains over the last 10 years or so to make clear that the countries must make use of the flexibility that the FATF standards provide when they construct their national legislation uh, to, to implement the standards. Um, so countries that, where, that provide for um, very strict requirements in their uh, national legislation that have, that have an exclusionary effect are actually penalized in the FATF's uh, view, in, in the assessments. Um, because in the, in the FATS view, that actually makes the system less effective to combat money laundering and, and terror financing. And, and the FATF comments on these uh, types of examples where they find them in, in, in their assessment processes. Um, so there's no requirement for the FATF, for instance, to have, for a country to, to ask for proof of address or any other particular information as far as, far as that is concerned. On the constitutional court challenge, I think it's also important to understand that the the challenge would not arise in a vacuum. So um, uh, when a uh, uh, particular regulation is made or law is passed, regulations are passed, or in this case, this, this type of amendment to the scope of the, the act is made, um, uh, the, the constitutional court will not entertain um, a hypothetical question uh, in the abstract. Um, to, to ask, is this constitutionally valid or not? 
there would have to be an application uh, of the regulation or the, the law in, in some particular form. And the um, defense against that from the affected party would be that the law in itself is constitutionally invalid and therefore should not be enforced. So in the context of, of the amendments to the FIC Act schedules, that would mean that the, uh, a supervisor would have to impose a, an uh, administrative sanction for non-compliance against an institution. And the institution would then challenge the constitutionality of the FIC Act and the requirement to apply uh, the, the FIC Act requirements to that type of institution uh, on a constitutional basis uh, for the matter to come before the constitutional court and for the constitutional court to consider the, uh, the question. Um, so in, in the absence of a specific uh, reason for the Constitutional Court to consider the question, uh, it's not likely that it would arise in the context of these amendments and the process now to bring about the amendments um, uh, or to, to bring the amendments into force. Um, unfortunately, I can, do not have the specifics on the, uh, to comment on the, the example of Botswana, um, except to say that uh, Botswana was placed in a very, very difficult position when the FATF um, considered that Botswana's measures to deal with money laundering and data financing were not uh, in line with the standard and Botswana was grey listed. Um, the impact of that was that, uh, and this, this applies to any grey listed country, um, that the European Union then uh, declared Botswana as a high risk jurisdiction and all banks in the European Union had to apply uh, very strict measures for dealing with uh, banks in Botswana, including the South African subsidiaries that operate in Botswana. Um, and that was uh, the reason for the urgency for Botswana to make sure that it was able to um, address the, um, the actions that were required of it to be removed from the FATS grey list and then consequently, so, or later on subsequently, to be removed from the list of high risk jurisdictions by the European Union. Now, I don't know if the issue of credit providers uh, was part of the scope of what Botswana had to do. That's something we can uh, look into and, and how that was dealt with if it was the case in, in the case of Botswana. But I thought it was just important to explain the uh, um, sort of more the general background on how Botswana uh, came to be listed and what the effect of that was for the country. Um, I think I've covered all the specific points. If I haven't, uh, please remind me and I'll, I'll try my best to, to pick up on, on some of those. Uh, thank you, Vigilia, I'll hand back to you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, that, 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 that's it from our side, so. Okay, uh, colleagues, can I make a suggestion about process, right? But I'm not sure. Uh, that is the best way to go forward. Instead of us putting questions immediately to Treasury, it, maybe it's better we ask um, uh, the Federation, yeah, Retail Cloth uh, Clothing Federation, to respond to them. Because you see, speaking from a very subjective point of view, I thought that they had a very good case in the Retail Clothing Federation. And then I heard the response from Treasury and the FIC. And I feel they also have quite a credible case. I think it's too soon to decide. So <laughs> before I say anything, I would prefer that, <coughs> excuse me, we have the Federation reply first, but let me see what colleagues say. Um, is there any view on that colleagues? Uh, yeah, I think there's a yeah, lot to digest, and I think there's two very different approaches. Um, yeah. I, you know, I think certainly from my perspective, I think there's a little more research needed uh, to try and get yeah. to, to the bottom. But yeah, uh, let's hear as much as we can. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. In that case, shall we go for that? Then is anybody else who's a contrary view in Kurilika? Do you see any hand up? No, I didn't see no, any hand up. Doesn't. Okay. All right. Can you reply? Because it's quite a formidable reply to you. Uh, although I don't think they've answered many questions either. Willie's also got load shedding that starts. It's going to be a nightmare this week, I know. We've had four hours already, but I'm fine till two o'clock. Uh, right, go for it, um, uh, our stakeholders here. Chair, thank you, Joe. Uh, we, we, we do appreciate it, and thank you to Treasury for, for, for the response. Um, Chair, the first thing I'd like to say is that 
context of Treasury's response does indicate that we have made um, repeated um, attempts to engage on, on this matter. They've, uh, and there are a couple of times where they've quoted slightly outdated uh, earlier responses rather than our more um, updated, uh, updated ones. I'm gonna, I am going to, as I've done before, ask for um, more specific uh, legal response from the team and or industry response um, um, from the team. We, we, but we do, we would appreciate a copy of that um, presentation. We have struggled in previous times to get a copy of. of, of no, um, Inkuleleke will send it to you right now. He's very good. He'll send it to you right you, now. Thank you so much, Chair. Um, and, and then let me let me hand over to the team for, for now, and I'll make some uh, some more specific comments from my side as well. And um, if we could start on the on the legal side, please. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Um, so. Obviously, once we've had the opportunity to study the, the presentation in detail, we will provide more specific responses. But just, um, you know, some quick points of like clarification that we just wanted to, to note right now while we while we have everyone on, on the same meeting. Um, it, it was certainly, it, it appeared to us as if um, the wording that was was being referred to in the presentation was the initial wording that was um, uh, submitted by the NCRF on their 12 August um, submission to the National Assembly Committee, rather than the current wording which has been submitted to the NCOP, which, as we discussed at the beginning of this um, submission, is a lot more refined because it, it, it takes only into account the stall uh, credit in a closed-loop environment. The previous um, submission um, exclude, proposed to exclude credit facilities and credit transactions as a whole, whereas currently what we are proposing is a much limited scope. So that's the first thing I wanted to say. I just wanted to make clear that we aren't proposing a wholesale exclusion of credit facilities and credit transactions. We understand that that's, that, that could cause problems. Then the other uh, thing I, is... I, I, hello, to expedite things and move things faster, Treasury. When you come back to us later this week, will you reply specifically to this, to this one? Fine, go ahead. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, the other thing is, is we are fully cognizant that the, that the FIC does apply a risk-based approach and that, you know, strictly speaking, that proof of residence might not necessarily be a requirement in law. The, what, what, what has been our experience in practice is that it is still something that is looked at in investigations and enforcement matters by the FIC. So um, that's just something that we will obviously respond in more detail later, but we would like to note that right now. And I think that ultimately, you know, a lot of the, um, the questions that have arisen goes back to the fact that no MLT risk assessment has been done for the sector. So the practical implications for both the FIC and the the uh, parties impacted by this change haven't been looked at and merged and discussed together. Um, and ultimately, I think that that's inescapably where we are right now. And, and, and that's why there's so many questions and very few answers. And just if I may comment on, on the, the constitutional risk to this, our submission is not that it will be struck down simply uh, on, on its terms. It is the impact. It is the impact that it will have. And as Karen has just referred to, no assessment has been done. And if, if the regulation is passed in its current form, uh, so we're instructed and so we, our clients assess, there will be this impact. And it's the impact which, which uh, in the previous case was discriminatory and for that reason it was struck down. So they will have, obviously there will be time and one will assess the impact. Unfortunately, if it's been passed already, one can't, one can't change the impact, but one may uh, have, to, have to seek legal recourse for that. And just one other comment on retrospectivity. We're not suggesting that it's retroactive in the sense that it automatically applies uh, uh, a, a, as, if it, as if it had been promulgated years ago. But the impact, and I think we, 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 we're probably on the same page with Treasury on this, uh, the impact in a, ma in a very short space of time is that everybody that is on any credit provider's books will be swept into the net and, and thereby effectively the, the regulation becomes retrospective because you cannot ignore and certainly in, in, a, in an audit by the FIC, it would be no answer to say, well, this is someone who's been on my books for three or four or five years. Everyone will be swept into the net and the impact is that it effectively is retrospective in the sense that it covers everyone on your books. Uh, and uh, with, with the attendant costs and, and inconvenience and so forth. Thank you, those are... So, Chair, thank you. We, we have received the presentation and, I, uh, and it's circulated to our team. 
um, we, we, we will commit to making a, a, a reply in respect of that in writing um, within a very short space of time before you meet and submit it to the, to the Secretariat. But Chair, our substantive position has not changed, which is what, what we end up with here is a position where still one size fits all. The, the, the regulatory framework will become a one size fits all. Um, the application of the law will become a one size fits all. And in a very, very short space of time, the nature of concerns that we have um, as, as in, in, in respect of practical implementation will, will actually become highly prejudicial to, to the consumer base that, that we, we've, we've identified and, and, and spoken about here. And we'll, we'll touch on that and speak to that further in our, in our written submission. But thank you. We'll keep our short response to Treasury in, the, in that regard. Uh, Treasury, do you want to reply before we come in? To these things, tentative as they may be, your replies. Hello, Vukile. Peter. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I think just very quickly, um, uh, we, we have tried to apply our mind to as, as best as we can to the new proposed wording, I, I know, but I think I'll. I'll uh, concern is still that the, the terminology of store cards, uh, closed loop, etc., are things that are used in practice and, in, and not in not legally defined. So, it might still exactly what the scope would be, what would be included, and what, what uh, would not be included. If even if those those uh, uh, ter the terms are used in in the, uh, de uh, the description of this item in the FICI. I think the, the challenge that we have here is the, the commentators, the NCRF, are looking at this from their own understanding of how this is applied in their own industry. Um, but this is not something that is restricted to their industry only. Um, any, any type of credit provider can make use of the same business model and provide the same closed loop uh, store card uh, in a completely different environment and a different risk category. And that, that's the sort of thing that I was trying to, uh, to refer to earlier that makes it very difficult for us to find the precise uh, ring fencing to exclude something if we want to exclude something entirely from the scope of the FRC Act. Um, so I'll just leave it at that. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Are there any hands up uh, in Kodilek? I don't see any. I know some people have of a clock. With the load shedding. Uh, is anybody wants to raise anything? Can you see anybody? No, Chair, there are no hands. All right. So, um, you know, colleagues, uh, I would like to suggest that both sides may not want to do this because they're fed up with uh, reaching out to each other. So the obligation is on Treasury, really. We're not going to rush this bill. And we have a limited time because of our commitments to plenary sittings. And, um, you know, you, you well know that the same people serve in two committees and we're in appropriations and so on. Uh, so, you know, it's in your own interest to meet. I, I suggest you meet outside this forum and see if you can arrive at some uh, consensus on what to do, because both sides seem to have credible arguments, although on the surface to me, my first sense is that Treasury's got a stronger, marginally stronger case here, at least for now, which is why I stress again that the team, in Kululeko, can you coordinate the team and get it going from our side? Frank, can you help us also? But uh, some of the issues that can be dealt with now or later in this week would revolve around, and if uh, the team can send some questions to Treasury as well to settle by the next meeting, which we'll decide on now, it's tentatively set for Friday, and let's see if we arrive at consensus about time and so on. The first thing then is, uh, I'm not very clear, Peter, did, 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 did the FIC do a sector study or not? Secondly, if I understand you, there is no requirement from FATF that um, no prescription, in other words, 
that uh, small credit providers, if that's how they could be called, require the proof of residence. They don't prescribe, but they seem to say, use your existing provisions and ensure you implement them or tighten them. Is that correct, if I understand it correctly? Um, the question that I don't fully understand is, is the gripe from this federation with Treasury or more with DTIC and the National Credit Regulator because there's existing provisions for how they must behave? So as I understand it, you did consult the NCR. And if DTIC was properly consulted and, you know, agreed to what is in the current version of the bill before us, I mean, they the overseeing authority there with the NCR. Uh, we can't, can we just like make changes without consulting the select committee on you know, trade industry and competition, I don't know. Um, uh, I notice the National Credit Act doesn't exclude retailers. I, I think that's correct. Um, these, these were the very same changes to scoff and scoff didn't accept them. Uh, can somebody, Tracy, can you reply, Bukile? What was scoff's argument? Why did they finally say no? On Botswana, yes, please. Can Treasury and our advocate Jenkins help us with that? Uh, I think I'll buy the argument that credit providers not treated as banks, really. Then on the cost of compliance, I mean, they seem to have a case. Uh, can you reply to these things either now in writing uh, the Federation? Cost of compliance are far lower. It's a one-off thing. Um, on the constitutional issue, Peter, as far as I know it, you know, a bill, a clause in a particular bill, or an entire bill can be taken to court even before it's promulgated. To, to be challenged for its constitutionality. Sometimes people have taken a vote, court, and then it becomes an act by the time the court decides, but it takes one or two clauses or sections and says, this is unconstitutional, and courts have found sometimes in the favor of the litigants and sometimes in the favor of the state. So I don't know what you mean that it'll only become something before the courts if, it's applied and some person is adversely affected and takes it to court. Although, of course, that will probably be a low income earner and they'll have to go to a legal services unit or something. I mean, legal, legal resources and so on uh, to challenge that. I'm not utterly convinced that there is a parallel between that decision taken already and the current one before us, but I don't know. Somebody might ask you, Treasury, if it's not a fat have requirement of residence, why have it? Are you going to argue it's there already? Well, it can't be there already because they're saying they now have to apply. Uh, the other option is to give the sector more time to implement it. But now, Frank points out that if it's a regulation, you either accept it or reject it. You can't amend it. But in a report, we can say we don't accept it and we suggest that they come back with the regulation in this form and we'll pass it within 14 days or whatever of its uh, tabling in the houses or such, such things. Um, then on the Vodacom story, the Vodacom presentation, which I read while listening to uh, the participants in today's meeting. Um, I'm a bit befuddled, really. I need to read it more carefully. But I'm a bit surprised that Vodacom, such a powerful company with a battery of lawyers internally and externally that they draw from, didn't understand what you are saying, uh, Peter. 
I mean, it sounds a bit odd that they suddenly at the last minute come to us. So I, I really find it puzzling. Your, your answer came across like as very simple, but yet they didn't seem to understand it. So, Frank, you should also apply your mind, the team with Esther. And uh, I think Esther just left because I'm um, presumably of the load shedding, but Poppy presumably is here. And Kululeko, can you coordinate them really? I think maybe we should have a brief meeting this afternoon uh, and, and decide on a way forward. Uh, yeah, so uh, let me start then with, with you uh, as the Federation. Do you want to respond to anything I've just said? Um, thank you, Chair. We, let, let me just say we are, we are quite happy to meet with Treasury if an uh, opportunity arises to do so as urgently as necessary. Um, in the context of the timetable, both of the committee and the minutes. Thank you. You don't want to say anything in response to anything I've said for now to expedite things. Because you can meet, remember, Parliament ultimately decides. You guys can even agree, so to speak. When I mean guys, I mean a plural sense. Right. But I'm saying ultimately we decide. So, so you know, it's not as if you can sit there and come to a conclusion. It just makes our ta a lot task a bit easier, but ultimately take our guidance from the parliamentary support team and you know uh, we decide as politicians. And we could be wrong in a technical matter like this. So that's why we're cautious about trading, you know, the way we go about things. This is not an easy, it's not like a clear policy decision on these issues. The policies are clear. We mustn't penalize the poor uh, and so on and so on, but we mustn't, uh, overburden them with, with, with credit they can't pay that will be destructive, uh, uh, unsecured debt, as it's called, and so on. So finding those balances, too, there's no, like, policy. It's, it's a case-by-case it's -case matter. And ultimately, you go by your political instinct where you can't decide. But you're also guided by what a, a, a committee that's uh, primarily involved with this has decided on, which is our partners in the National Assembly. But having said that, is there anything else you want to say quickly? Um, Chair, you, you, a number of elements have touched on the National Credit Act and the role of the National Credit Regulator, which yeah. we appreciate does bring in a, a complexity to, to the process. Yeah. And, and again, Chair, what we think may be more useful instead of having a ping pong backwards and forwards with Treasury, um, again, which is why I just brought the summary point, is it may just be a lot more useful that we sit with them and, and, and try and iron out what may, may hopefully just be a few kinks in the process. Um, and if there is a substantial difference that cannot be resolved, then yes, we, we need to put ourselves in the hands of Parliament and, and respond as necessary beyond that. Yeah, I like that idea that did occur to me. I can only propose it. I don't have the authority. Our committee doesn't to instruct the NCR to meet you. Well, we may do actually, we have Parliament, but we have to consult with the uh, select committee we have to brief them on this bill. It's, it's not an easy process, but we also have some deadlines. Uh, there's yet another bill coming in this area uh, to avoid, as you know, the fatter of grey listing prospects. So having said that, can I get the committee's view? Now, are there any hands up that we recommend, strongly recommend that the parties meet in the next 48 hours and then come back to us with uh, a response where they say we agree on this and we disagree on this and and these are the areas of disagreement that will just help us uh when i say parties i mean obviously treasury uh, fic and the federation but if treasury can negotiate for the ncr to be there and officials of dtic because it's the ministry that brings bills to parliament not the regulator uh, I don't know what latitude the regulator has got to uh, devise regulations, but presumably they table it also in the relevant portfolio committee and select committee. Uh, so for now, that is my suggestion. Bukile, what do you think? Is it doable? Are you in, Bukile? Is there anybody else from Treasury? Dennis, is your hand up? Was it an old man? No, it is up. It, 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 it's been up for quite some time. Uh, sorry, sorry. I only saw it now. No, no problem. No, it's, it's fine. There, there, there was a flow, so I didn't want to interrupt. Um, but yeah, just thanks to Eskim for helping me ensure I'm outstanding in my field. Um, <laughs> but, uh, 
So you can uh, ask you a practical question. How are you connected now? Are you connected to your 4G? Or, or uh, yeah, you there's a cell phone tower, but it's, di it's directionally dependent. So I've got to rush out and come and stand under the trees in the yard in order to get signal on the cell phone. Yes, but the problem I have here where I am, I used to be able to connect when the Wi-Fi collapsed because of load shedding, right? But then I used to use my 4G or 5G on Vodacom. But now yeah. what happens is because the mast, the, the relevant mast here, the, the word mast, is, is, is constantly being, because we have, apart from the load shedding of ESCOM, we have municipal load shedding, right? We have a lot of them. You can't connect. So once my Wi-Fi goes, I can't connect to the 4G. And I'm sorry to raise these things, but they become very practical this week uh, because it's load, load level six and possibly level seven. Uh, so, so, so I don't know how others do, but it's not possible for me. I hope Njadu yeah. and Mama Rafa are listening because the meeting is going uh, ahead. Yeah. Okay, quickly. What, what I've experienced is that the, the batteries are just not getting enough time to recharge, the ones yeah. that power the, the mast. So, yeah, they. Yeah. Uh, it gives us about an hour of coverage, and then we also sit like it's 1970 again. But um, yeah, Chair, just, just on the matter at hand, I do think that a meeting a meeting is important, and and I think that that you know the 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 question from Vodacom, the inputs from Treasury responding to the Federation saying that there was a misunderstanding about uh, you know what the implications are. All of these things point to kind of a lack of certainty and perhaps a lack of clarity that is brought, brought about by the regulations. Uh, that's specifically why I said I thought that I need to do a little bit more research between now and Friday. Is, and, and I mean, I, I've asked for, for, for some information, as you saw, um, because I, I do believe that, that there's kind of a lot of gray area here. And, and we, we're not all getting the same understanding from the regulations as they've been presented. So that lack of clarity, I think, is perhaps what's causing the issue. So I, I do think that sitting around a table is going to be of tremendous assistance um, to the role players, um, but also important for us to, to, to kind of get the signal that uh, people out there are not sure, uh, even with the legal minds behind Vodacom, et cetera, they, they're not sure of the impact of, of, of these regulations. Um, and yeah, they, they seem to be very heavy handed. If they're not so heavy handed, I think Treasury needs to respond to, to, to us and, and kind of really make us comfortable with that. But I do believe that we need to get a better understanding and there needs to be more clarity. So yeah, please go away, have a chat to each other by, by all means and let's see where we can find common ground. But I do think that there's a lot more work to be done for me as well. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, can other members comment, please? Because uh, I, I mean, is this two of us have said they should go and meet, which is a process we do use in situations like this. So it's not unprecedented. So maybe I should ask: Is there anybody in the committee that's opposed to this discussion that must take place before we meet on Friday? In Kululiko, I don't see any hands up, but then some people might have fallen away. Now, Chairperson, there are no hands. All right, then in that case, we are, we are proposing that, uh, as far as I know, it's legally binding or not. Uh, the parliament. It's, never, it's never not happened before when we've suggested it. We haven't done this in this term of parliament, but in the NA side, when Tikaledi and I were there, we did it several times. It does help. Otherwise, we're going to sit here for hours and hours, Mukile, Peter, because we ain't just going to vote on this bill, right? We're not allowed to do so. We have to understand all the issues. If it takes hours and hours, so be it. We'd prefer it, right? Uh, uh, oh, yes, he points out with Section 12. Yeah, we did do that. Yeah. Oh, man, that was even more challenging. I remember now, yes. It's going to help all parties, Mukile. So our view is come to us after you've had a discussion. Parliament has done that many times. It has assisted all of us, including Parliament, to process things expeditiously. You don't meet, it's going to mean sitting here uh, uh, for many, many hours. And this is not a bill we can dilly-dally on either. But on the other hand, there's nothing. Fatah doesn't, uh, and Treasury cannot override the Constitution and our obligations as a parliamentary committee. That won't happen, okay? And it can't happen. So, you know, the choice is yours, Bukile. You're on your team. Yeah, so over to you, Bukile. Will you guys meet with them? They say they find to meet with you in the next 48 hours. We meet on Friday. 
Certainly, Chair. Th thank you so much. Chair, can I just confirm what form you'd like us to revert to you? Is, is that in a response document uh, to, to be sent to you? Is, is that the form of, the, of communication you'd prefer? Just to, just yeah. to make sure. Well, firstly, firstly, what I'm saying is you must do what you meant to do, which is present the answers for our records. It'll help us all to shape our... I see Poppy is here, Poppy. It'll help to shape our draft report. So... The, the draft report would say, in our meeting, uh, the Federation raised the following five issues. This was Treasury's reply. So we need your replies to set the record, right? And even if this does go to the Constitutional Court, uh, you know, not that we're afraid of that. We've never been afraid of that. Uh, uh, you know, at least they have an idea of what the issues were before at least our committee, and presumably they'll want to know what happened at SCOF. So... Um, Please do that reply. But in the meanwhile, I mean, what you could do is even do the reply before you meet the Federation, right? Mm -hmm. Then you meet the Federation, and when you come back, you can just do a simple overview. Look, on these four issues, we agreed. On these two issues, we couldn't find each other. And on these two issues, we will never agree, okay? Or whatever it is, right, for these reasons. That's all we want from you. Now, we would like to meet in Kuleleko, I think, if need be, I will ring to house chair also. He's never turned out. Instead, colleagues are meeting at an odd hour, like 5 p.m. Or was it 4.30 p.m. on Friday? Because the house has got a special arrangement, as important as it is, on the women's charter in one of the provinces. Uh, can we seek a meeting for 10 o'clock in Kuleleko? Now, Chairperson, I will submit an application to that effect. Yeah, and, and I will ring Jomo, uh, Mr. Nyambi, if there's not a reply quickly. So we will let you know by tomorrow around noon at the latest, because you have to get permission to meet while the House is having some uh, workshop. Or is it, uh, I think it's the Women's Charter, they go from province to province. So in short, we tended to be meeting at, at 10, but if need be, we'll meet in the afternoon. If it's absolutely out, then we will meet next Tuesday. If you need more time, if you come back to us by Thursday, one o'clock or so, and say, guys, we can't do it, contact in Kulaleko, and he will discuss it with me, and I take it the committee will find if we instead meet on Tuesday. Rather, we have an expeditious, proce expeditious processing of the uh, uh, issues than sit here and have endless hours of discussions that sometimes fly over our head. Okay. So, we can't meet next week. Parliament ri rises. Yeah, well, if that's the case, oh yeah, of course. Sorry, let me just look at what it says in the chat. Uh, chat. Oh yeah, Parliament rises this week. Bowman says we can meet National Treasury at all tomorrow. Yeah, well, let's not even discuss through the phone. I think you, you must exchange phone numbers. Uh, yeah, we would like to meet on Friday, you see, but at the end of the day in Kululeko, uh, I think we should try to meet at 10. That's our first option. If we can't, in any case, can I point out that because Parliament's not sitting next week, I thought it was sitting, well, in an earlier program it had till next week. Okay, so, since Parliament's not sitting next week, in any case, we can't rush the bill to the House. We can only vote on the bill in the fourth quarter. So, uh, yeah, we can even meet next Tuesday. Yeah, I was going to suggest what Dennis is saying. There's no reason why we can't seek a meeting for next Tuesday morning during the constituency period. So can I go to Treasury and um, if, I, if I see, can you meet with them before Friday, 10 o'clock? say by Thursday night, or would you prefer to defer things until next Tuesday? What would you prefer, Vakila? Chair, uh, on our side, we're, we're happy to meet before uh, this week. Um, All right, so you'd rather we meet on Friday? Yes, Chair, but I, may, may I just double check with our FIC colleagues, but certainly on our side, that shouldn't be a problem. Right. Uh, yes, certainly, uh, Gilead, Mr. Chair, from our side as well, we will be happy to join the Good. meeting. I, I see some members saying next Tuesday won't work. All right, so look, 
basically here it is, right? We are going to meet at 10 o'clock on Friday. If you guys have not satisfactorily met our requirement to meet and discuss, and it's not nominal, okay? You don't just meet for the sake of meeting. This is addressed to the state agencies, yeah? Because that's what half the time happens. The Treasury doesn't, actually. I know people endlessly complain about Treasury not consulting, and when you look at what we see, that's not true. What they mean is they couldn't get what they wanted, so they blame Treasury for lack of consultation. So, and I've noticed that this thing has been on the agenda for two years and more, right? Tuesday will work for me, says Willie. Oh, all right. Well, whatever. We've agreed on Friday at 10 o'clock for now. Only we have to get permission from the powers that be, and you will be notified. If it's not 10 o'clock, it'll be sometime in the afternoon, okay? So we'll meet on Friday so people are not affected with the constituency period. Thank you. Is there anything else? No. Okay. Thank you, then. And we shall meet next week. Oh, sorry, sorry, on Friday. Sorry, Friday. Thank you, everybody. The meeting is drawn to a close. Unless, is there any other hand up? Uh, I don't see any other hand up. I don't see any hand, Chair. All right, thank you. Then we are done. Thank you, Jay. Thank you all. I can't hear most of you. I think that's Mama Rahani. Thank you, Chair. Oh, now I hear you. Okay, my friend. Bye. See you. Bye. 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 Bye.